Welcome everybody to what's, uh, I don't want to start it like that. What's up everybody, my name is Josh and I am the host of What's Up Fandom. And today we are joined by two very special guests. Uh, joining us once again, uh, probably from his bunker in beautiful Canada, uh, we have <laughs> actor extraordinaire, Mr. Jason Simpson. Yes, I am 50 feet underground, surrounded by concrete. In Canada. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. you know, we have to preface that. We're like, you're in Canada. Right. So it's snowing. There's a lot it's of permafrost. It's snowing, uh, yeah. permafrost. There's polar bears. Polar bears, everything. yeah. Um, the free healthcare is running rampant. Uh, it's like <laughs> wild the in the streets. That's right. Uh, and today we are also joined by author, writer, and playwright, Jonathan Mawberry. Mayberry. Mayberry. See, I should have asked before we started, but you know Long, what? Long A. Lincoln Bakery. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, and by it, the way, to, to bust on another UK uh, nation, um, it's it's uh, the Scottish spelling. The British put the Y in there because they don't know how to pronounce things. That makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. I can see it. Um, but Jonathan, just maybe for some of our uh, listeners who may not be familiar with your work, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a New York Times bestselling author of... Uh, I actually work on my 37th novel now. Um, I write comics for Marvel, IDW, Dark Horse, and currently DC. Um, I teach writing. I'm a former bodyguard in the entertainment industry and martial and jiu-jitsu master, uh, retired, and also executive producer of um, uh, V Wars, which was a show based, a Netflix show based on my uh, uh, books and comics, and also on a couple other projects that I have coming up, including a film adaptation of um, my Rotten Ruin series, which is a post-apocalyptic zombie series, the official sequel in, uh, to Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, I, that was one of the things, like when, when we first, uh, like I first heard about uh, your work, just as I was on Webtoon, and there's like a, there's like a webcomic version of Rotten Ruin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this looks pretty interesting. And then I proceeded to then buy, as I drop them, I proceeded to buy all five of the books that were out in this convenient, big, huge, rotten, ruined set. And that's when I reached out and was like, yeah, I want to talk to you now just because I'm having a, a blast with these, with these books. So it's like, yeah, I want to get you on. Let's, let's, let's have a chat. Let's yeah, talk some rotten ruins. Lands. So you have Broken Lands there too. That's yes, do you have book, Broken Lands. That's book six and book seven comes out in uh, November. Yeah, November oh. 3rd, I believe. And that's... Uh, Lost, uh, Lost Roads, yeah. That I and like not really, like really like I know you have also have the the Joe Ledger series, which I didn't know, but it seems like everything kind of connects. Like you've got the Rotten Ruin, which connects with the Joe Ledger, which connects with Broken Lands, which all it's all kind of tied together in this nice like cornucopia of young adult and zombie thriller action. Yeah, my uh, couple of uh, bookstores have started calling it the Mayberry verse. I'm not sure that's a term I would have picked, but uh -huh. um, yeah, I, I, years ago I had I'd had I've been at the, the Edgar Awards in in New York and got to sit and talk with uh, uh, Stephen King and his family for a while, cool. and King recommended that I start bringing my characters from one book series into another. He said fans dig it, and then I'll have fun with it as well because you know it is all all in my weird head so it's mm -hmm. part of my weird world there are some books that don't have crossovers but very few usually there's some even if it's a tiny obscure reference there's some crossover to it yeah like i didn't know that uh broken lands was like broken lands and everything like lost road were a continuation of like rotten ruin until i started digging into it because like we're giving away uh, two copies of Broken Lands on uh, for this episode, oh, so cool. I was like, okay, we're gonna go ahead and we'll we'll do some things. And then I was like looking at everything. I was like, Gutsy Gomez, that's pretty cool. And I was like, oh, there's Benny Amora and Joe Ledger. Like, oh snap, everything's like connected. Yeah, weirdly, um, it, it was supposed to come out as Rotten Ruin Book Six, and for some reason they didn't call it that. Uh, and that was a, a kind of a very weird thing because it is, it is a continuation of the series. It takes place a year after the uh, Fire and Ash, which is the fourth of the original arc with the bridge of bits and pieces, the short story mm -hmm. collection. Um, 
and it's definitely a rotten ruin book. I mean, it, it actually wraps up the next one wraps up the rotten ruin story in a, in a big way. So when you say that they named it something else, you don't get uh, full control of that. What happened is my, my editor, uh, who was a great editor, you know, fantastic editor is, is extremely ill and had to retire. And another editor stepped in just to finish the process. And somehow there was a miscommunication in there and the book went out mm. without the, the cover oh. saying it's a rotten ruin book. Oh, I, wow. believe, I believe they will correct that for lost roads. The last book in the series that comes out in uh, November. I see. Oh, that's yeah. That kind of thing. Like I, personally like i'm on flesh and bone so like i'm like part way through the third book right now um That's so it's it's quite nice now now okay so real quick so the way that this thing that i got it goes rotten ruin dust and decay flesh and bone fire and ash and then bits and pieces do i need to move like bits and pieces before fire and ash or no. is Bits and Pieces is a collection of short stories that's set before and during the okay. original four books. It's backstory to some of the characters. It's original stories with other characters. So it's, it's really a collection of the short fiction that I, I've been doing while writing that series. Uh, I wouldn't read it before um, any of the other, the first four books, because there, there, there are spoilers in there. Okay. Uh, so so do do it, as five, book five. So do it like this as like finish fire and ash and then bits and pieces. Yeah. I mean, and there is one other thing that kind of, kind of goes in the middle of it, but it's not crucial. I did one graphic novel, a comic book series, a collecting of a graphic novel called uh, Rotten Rune Warrior Smart. And it takes place between Dust and Decay and Flesh and Bone. It's not okay. crucial to have read it, but it, uh, it was a nice, there's a gap in the story there. Yeah, right? there is. There's like like five months or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they're, they're going from, from California to Nevada on foot. So I, I wrote a story that takes place in the middle of that. And uh, I was published by IDW and we had a you know big fan following of it. But um, I think when uh, with the Rotten Ruin webtoon that they're doing, they may actually include that because we have, I'm just checking now, 289,000 subscribers to the Rotten Ruin webtoon. Mm -hmm. Number one horror comic on webtoon. Fantastic. And they're going to want more content. I mean, they're, right now they're doing the first book, I think 60 episodes for the first book, but they're going to definitely want to go uh, beyond that. And that's, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's like that, that was when I first, you know, got into Rotten Ruin and I was like, okay, I'm really digging this. But with Webtoon, like you've got weekly updates and you can only go like X amount into the future with those. I think you can buy up to three, three volumes. Um, so like I was already caught up with that and I was like, I want to know more. This seems like it's more story driven. And then it said based on the books by, and I was like, okay, that's when I was like, now I must learn and yeah, figure and out. And then I found out that there were like 17 books, not right, <laughs> but like there are so many books. And I was like, well, I'm well, just going to go ahead and buy that entire case. You're not entirely wrong because <laughs> Uh, the, uh, there's a series of four books for adults called Dead of Night, Fall of Night, Dark of Night, and Still of Night. Even though they're for adults, they're actually the story of how the zombie apocalypse in, in Rotten Moon happened. They're set for Okay, so it's like back. the night. Like, yeah, the, what they call First Night. The First you know? Night, yeah. And it's that whole series. And uh, that was, the first book in that series is actually George Romero's uh, favorite zombie novel. It was dedicated to him, and it's one of the ways in which he and I became close friends. Wow, amazing. Uh, yeah, George was a great guy. Yeah. And then, then we went on from there to uh, co-edit Knights of the Living Dead, an anthology of stories set in the 48 hours around Night of the Living Dead. But one story in there was one that he asked me to write to take a character, actually the, the older brother of Tom Amora, who Benny never meets, the older brother um, from the Joe Ledger series, he was a sniper in the Joe Ledger series, and have him go from the end of Fall of Night all the way to the house in Night of the Living Dead. So it actually puts Night of the Living Dead officially, by George Romero's request, in the world of these books. Oh, wow, man. man. Yeah, I may have ugly cried when he requested no that. No doubt. Oh, that, that, oh. Was, yeah, that was crazy. Wow. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to come out straight here. And the reason that I wanted Jason on this episode was because Jason is a big horror man. Like, he likes the scary stuff. And I am a wuss. Like, I can't, I can't do it. When I saw Paranormal Activity, I had to go to a friend's house and sleep with a rosary. That's how bad it was. Like, I couldn't do it. Like, I was like, I can't spend the night in my apartment by myself. Like, I have to be with somebody else. Uh, so, you know, it's you know, funny. I got, I got a, a you remind me of a buddy of mine. Um, 
when I was 10 years old, I snuck into the movie theaters to see uh, the original premiere, world premiere of Night of the Living Dead, October 2nd, 1968. My buddy who went with me um, was not a huge horror fan, and we were not prepared for Night of the Living Dead. I mean, nobody was prepared for Night no, of the Living Dead. No, yeah. bet not. He left halfway through it, had bedwetting issues into his 20s. Wow. Um, I stayed to see it twice. So same planet, different worlds. I've not wet the bed. <laughs> it, didn't, it, it, didn't, it didn't get me that bad. Um, but no, yeah, I just can't do it. Like, too much for me. Too much for me. Like, zombies, zombies are one of those ones where I'm okay with zombies because, like, there is a way to beat zombies. You know, it's, it's a numbers game, really, with zombies. Yeah. Whereas, like, demons and things like that, I'm like, no, that's... <laughs> That's religious stuff. I can't. I can't get there. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Demons don't do a thing for me. Um, uh, it's zombies first, and when I was a kid, werewolves. Oh man, I was terrified of werewolves. I was convinced there was one in my house somewhere. They're just so fast, werewolves. Like zombies. Like, and I like what you do with with your zombies, uh, where they, you know, they're very slow moving. They kind of like stop sometimes. I thought that was really cool. Where like they just. If there's nowhere for them to go, they'll just you can see like just a field of like zombies that just like aren't moving because they're like there's no food, so we're just gonna stop. They go into hibernation, yeah, to a degree, yeah. which is and, really uh, cool. Like, I thought that was a really cool, clever idea. Yeah, there, it's funny. I one of the things I did when I was writing Rotten Ruin is I didn't want to hit the even though I was setting it more or less in the world of, of George Romero's type of zombies, I didn't want to hit the same cliches with zombies, so I did a, actually a lot of research. Um, on you know zombie bite strength, uh, uh, rates of decay, hot, uh, the parasites that would drive it because they're parasitic based. Um, mm -hmm. I did a lot of work with parasitologists and epidemiologists to come up with a a reasonable and even plausible um, zombie pathogen. We tried to get I wanted to get to about twenty percent believable or doable. We got to seventy percent doable, wow. which is scary as hell. Luckily, that last thirty percent not doable, and you know we can all like. Um, but yeah, we got close. Yeah. Like you did, uh, something in there that I thought was really cool. Like with, in the second book, uh, spoilers, uh, Chong gets bit, but it's just one of those, like, it's just the teeth and it just kind of like pulls the skin away. And so he thinks he's been bit and then it's like, no, like it's like the saliva and like the germs and everything from the mouth. Like you just got teeth. So you'll be okay. I thought that was really clever because usually it's one of those, like, if it's, like, The Walking Dead or whatever, somebody gets bit, and it's, like, you're done. Like, that's just the way zombie works nine times out of ten. Yeah, and much as I enjoy The Walking Dead, the science in that is really faulty. They, they smear zombie blood all over them. You're telling me these people living rough in the wild and fighting have no cuts or scratches, no open wounds? Yeah. So, Jonathan, do you consider yourself a bit of a purist when it comes to that? So, like, zombies who run really fast or zombies who are now able to think or uh there's some logic in there does that kind of stuff bother you or are you okay with those uh, translations of that here here's why i'm okay with it um and this is something george and i romero and i talk about a lot uh if you watch his range of movies zombies yeah. do think they yeah. do and they start reclaiming their intelligence they they uh remember they have some, you know, uh, memories. Bub from Day of the Dead. Yes. A number of things. Big Daddy has grief over the death of other zombies and forms yeah. a form of attack. So, you know, I'm I'm in keeping with Romero on that, that they're an evolving third as, a third state of existence. There's living, there's dead, and then there's living dead, which is a completely new thing. A little bit of both. But right. as far as the other zombie forms, the fast and slow, I'm okay with it because none of the zombies that we talk about are folkloric. They're not based on any belief system. They're not the Haitian voodoo zombie. It's a whole different thing. The, yeah. the name was hung on the, on the Romero monsters, but that, he wasn't intending to create zombies. So because it's entirely fictional, there are no rules. Um, and there, there are people who, you know, I've been on panels, um, hundreds of panels about zombies. People say, oh, well, zombies don't use tools. And I'm like, watch Night of the Living Dead. They pick up boards, they pick up rocks. Zombies don't run. Yeah, they, uh, the, the graveyard zombie runs after Barbara's car. That's right. They, they, zombies only eat human flesh. Really, I see zombies eating insects off of trees. All of the things that people say aren't, you know, canon with Romero are in the Romero films. Mm. Lots of fucking films, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and also, mo you know, I'm friends with almost everyone who's been writing zombie books. You know, Max Brooks and, and uh, Isaac Marin did Warm Bodies and 
uh, all those guys. And you know, we all take a different interpretation of it. It's all a matter of whether the story is good enough to support your version of the mythology that you're creating. Awesome. Um, and one last little thing to throw in, as far as fast infected, Romero invented that genre too with the crazies. So 28 Days Later, not a true zombie film, is actually an extension of Romero's The, the Crazies because he's, in 1972, he started the story about people getting infected and turning murderous. So he invent, invented both the genre, zombie genre as we know it and the fast infected genre. And between those two poles, you have fast and slow and all sorts of stories you can play with. And then of course, as fiction people, we're invited to tell our own tales. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Which you do, awesome. and, and I do like that you do incorporate some of like the fast moving zombies in Rotten Rune as well. So I like that there is a little bit, there are like the outliers in everything. So it's, it's, it makes it quite good. It gives a lot of depth to the story and the world that you've created. I appreciate it. I've actually written 13 zombie novels now in different series two Joe Ledger zombie novels, the seven Rotten Ruin books, and the four Dead of Night books. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to check out Dead of Night because plus, plus a bunch of guys. Actually, Dead of Night is the only book I ever wrote that gave me nightmares. Oh, that's during, not good. During yeah. the writing. Yeah, during the writing. Wow. Because one of the the conceits, and we find this out like in the first chapter, so it's not a spoiler. Um, when somebody in that with that parasitic infection uh, becomes a zombie, the zo- you know the parasites take over all motor control, and, and the body goes out and does what a zombie does but the consciousness of the original person is still there, attached attach to all five senses, but not the motor con- uh, control. So they are helpless passengers as their bodies go and kill the people around them, friends, family, whatever. And they, they can't stop it. They can only experience every sight, sound, taste, smell. They're there for the whole ride. And that's true all the way up into Rotten Ruin. Mm. Yeah. Wow. You talking about that, but like it gave you nightmare, like, like crying. Like, I'm like, man, the, I've got like no chance here. Like, <laughs> it's it's more, more of an empathic thing. My, I wrote that while my father-in-law, who I love dearly, was going through dementia. And here's a guy who is, I mean, was an absolutely brilliant jazz musician, uh, recording artist. And then was going, we saw him leaving in bits and pieces and detaching himself from his family. And the fact that he's, you know, forgetting them and sometimes having emotional swings does damage to them as, as well. So they love him, but they're being hurt by the process of what he's going through and completely helpless on either side to do anything about it. Well, I use that as, as inspiration for Dead of Night. So where did, like, where does your inspiration for these come from? Like, what was it, you know, when you were 10 years old and you were seeing Night of the Living Dead for the first time or the first two times? Like, where, where did it really, you know, kind of click for you? Well, that, that, that was my, uh, my introduction to zombies. And I have spent a considerable portion of my life planning how I would survive the zombie apocalypse. I mean, I as would most to, people do, as most people do, but I may have abused the privilege a bit. Uh, <laughs> when I move into a new apartment, I, I actually do, as I'm walking to, downstairs to take the dog, I'm looking at, well, how would I barricade this? Or yeah. what happened if, if one of the neighbors came? It's a constant thing. And uh, so I've spent more time thinking about zombies than anything else, than any other wow. uh, supernatural thing. Vampires being next. And, I also wrote a bunch of books, nonfiction books, on the folklore of supernatural monsters like vampires and werewolves, and one nonfiction book about zombies, uh, Zombie CSU, The Forensics of the Living Dead. Interviewed hundreds of people um, in different fields about how the real world would react, research, and respond if Night of the Living Dead was a real thing. Oh, wow. And uh, one of the crazy things is, I I talked to police, uh, forensic pathologists, all sorts of scientific experts, the clergy, the press, every single person I interviewed had already thought about it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that like when I was, I I worked at a movie theater for four, three or four years. And so that was one of the things that we were like, all right, so if something happens, movie theater is great because we were a movie theater and a mall. So it was like, that's perfect. We have a nice gate that we can shut down. Yeah. Every time it's like, you can't get through this gate. There's an upstairs and a downstairs. It has its own backup generator. We've got food and water and all kinds of stuff. So it's like, we'll be able to survive here for a little bit. We had roof access to the top yeah. of the mall. So it was like, we can do this. We can that's, make this work. That's Dawn of the Dead, man. Right yeah. there. Dawn of the Dead. 
It's yeah. like, and we're in the mall, so it's like, all right, so we just make sure that we go and we get all the doors to like the mall locked and then yeah. make sure everything's down where we need to get down. Because I mean, we can go through, we, you don't want to know how long we talked about this. I believe, I believe <laughs> the it. Theater. I, like, I, when, when I visit schools around the country and around the world, I actually play a game with them on how, how would you survive the zombie apocalypse? Coming up with important plans and asking each person what their skill set is. Like, um, it's a team building thing and a confidence building thing. But even if you get a kid, like we were in Italy, in Tuscany, doing this at some schools in, in rural Tuscany. And, you know, I was asking the kids what they do well, what they're good at. One kid said, oh, you, his family are all tailors. A couple of the other kids were chuckling. And I said, yeah, you're going to laugh. He's the guy that's going to make the body arm that's going to keep you alive. Without him, you are dead. Also, if, if he's around anyone with first aid, he's going to learn how to stitch wounds. Would yep. you rather bleed out or have, have this guy in your corner? You want to mock him now? And they're like, oh, shit, he's cool. You know? And he's now <laughs> the prime minister of Italy. So... <laughs> I did a dinner at the uh, the house of the mayor of Luca because of that. Side note, as a pop culture thing, Luca, a town in Tuscany, has the largest Comic Con in Europe. It's five hundred thousand people. Wow! Yeah, dang, five hundred thousand takes over the entire town. And I was a guest for uh, for because of the Italian publishers of Rotten Ruin brought me over, and uh, they they were the ones that sent me around to schools to to do this. You know how to survive the zombie apocalypse thing. And what's fun is when I pit the kids against the adults, the kids always have a smarter plan. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously. Optimism like, and cooperation trump, oh, I hate to use that word, uh, beat. Beat, uh, yes. Beat's a better word. Beat's a better word. Beat, beat people who are just regurgitating cliched stuff from movies. Uh, the kids actually think their way through it. And then if, it, if the zombie apocalypse happens, I'm going to find a group of teenagers and I'm going to I want to hang out with them. I'll protect them because I'm I'm big and tough, and I you know martial arts guy. But I'm gonna let them make some <laughs> good plans. Yeah, like man, it's it's one of those it's one of those things that I don't I don't know how long like we, you know, spent just like you know when I was a kid and everything. We're just talking about zombies and everything like that because like zombies was always the one where like we could we could survive zombies like if we get. Slower, or, or we could last. We, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not like rage virus. Like twenty eight days, we're done. It's like if that happens. Like, say we're at the we're at the beginning. Like we're at the opening of the channel, and you see all those guys coming through. It's like just just find a way to end it quick. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm the first to over myself and say, dude, the buffet's open. You know. Yeah, it's like just we're done. Like we can't we can't do anything here. Um. So what about like movies growing up? Was like there anything you know like really really big? that you know like really stuck with you uh well yeah i mean the scariest movie i've ever seen is still scary and it's the haunt the original haunting of hill house which came out oh, in the late 60s i was born in 58 so you know it, it was that was on tv by the time i was 10 it scared the hell out of me mm. and this mo same movie theater i i snuck into uh every saturday afternoon they would have a horror double feature one new film and one classic film so I got, you know, every week I was getting to see the Universal films, the, the early Hammer films. Um, by the time Exorcist came along, I was kind of jaded, you know, by then. Um, and The Omen, I, I, you know, you mentioned working in a theater. I worked The Omen as a theater usher. And uh, half, the, half the audience were Catholic nuns. Oh, wow. And they'd, they'd get to the scene where, where he's cutting a little kid's hair and he's finding the 666. Yeah. And the crazy nanny jumps on him. We had a nun get so upset, she like, ah, and threw up all over a guy in front of her. Oh. He's like, he stands up, what the? And then he sees the nun, and there's nowhere to go with that. Oh. <laughs> Got 20 nuns staring at him, and he's like covered in, in nun puke, and he's like, well. <laughs> <laughs> nun puke. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, the the movies that that is, real fact, quick, real quick, Num Puke is that holy? Uh, it is. It is. It is okay. Yeah. Like, um, I didn't know if it was like like on on par with like holy water. Like oh, how no, it, how is I like mean, Nun Vom? Like is that like high yeah, up nun, there? Nun Puke is is you know especially one so passionately delivered to a, a, a congregant. Yeah. Um, but the other films that really impacted me, uh, I loved uh, Curse of the Werewolf, Oliver Reed. Uh, because it was it was much more of a character drama and a very tortured story. Plus, he was a very cool looking werewolf. Um, ah. I tried to cosplay him once and realized I did not have six pack abs as uh, Oliver Reed did at the time, so that didn't work as well. He had the torn shirt, and you know. What year was that? Oh God, uh, 72, 73, something like that. Do you know who? Do you remember off the top of your head who did the effects for that or the makeup? 
No, I, mean, I really don't. It was, it was an early, I'm pretty sure it was an early Hammer film. Hammer, yeah. Okay, that's, I'm just wondering. They, yeah. they, they just had such great, Hammer had such, I want to say cheesy, but at the same time, so memorable and shocking and such wonderful uh, makeup effects. Yeah, I mean, they, they did some really good stuff before they started becoming a little too self-referential, like the end of the Dracula series. Right, yeah. The beginning, the horror of Dracula was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Curse of Frankenstein, the first one of those was really powerful too, with Christopher Lee as the monster. Mm -hmm. The Peter Cushing is Frankenstein, but uh, there were there were some really great horror films that, that that had lasting effects, including you know some recent stuff that I felt you know very impactful. Train to Busan. Oh, oh Train yeah. to Busan was amazing. Uh, I, we're getting a sequel to that, aren't yes. we? And there there is yeah. an animated prequel to it as well. Yeah, Station. not as great, you know. It, uh, that that three D animation, it like that. It, it hurts me inside. I'm yeah. like, give me 2D. Go back to 2D drawings. It always looks better. <laughs> I agree. Um, but some of the others, like Dog Soldiers, my favorite werewolf film of all time. Dog Soldiers is great. I just just watch that. Yeah. Really, really well. Um, Stare of Echoes, uh, which is a, a ghost story. It's one of my two favorite ghost stories. That and Below, about a haunted submarine. Bruce Flew McDonald? Completely... Or Bruce uh, Greenwood, I think. Yeah, yeah. Flew almost completely under the radar, but it was a great flick. Is that two? Who, David Tui? No. And my favorite giant monster film, oddly, other than them, which is, you know, probably the first great giant monster film, was Gorgo, because Gorgo wins. Um, if you ever saw the movie Gorgo, they, they find, in Wales, they find uh, this, this giant monster, and they bring him back to England and put him in Piccadilly Circus, and turns out he's, a, he's an infant, and mommy's coming, and mommy's oh, Gorgo. pissed. And Gorgo, I mean, the mom's mother just stomps through London, stomps it flat, takes baby and leaves. Basically, fuck your human race. Don't mess with mama. And they win. And I'm sitting there going, what? Mama won? You know, it was great. Um, so I, I have a lot of, I've watched a lot of horror films, as you may have guessed. Sure. Um, you know, Alien and Aliens among my favorites, which is one of the reasons I actually did an alien anthology. Uh, Aliens Bug Hunt, um, all about the Colonial Marines. I get to play in a lot of these weird worlds, which makes it fun. You know, my job is, I, you know, it's a bizarrely fun job. So Aliens Bug Hunt lives, is, is in that alien It's an official universe? Alien, yeah, it's, it's a, an official Aliens book. All the stories had to be canon. Yeah. That, that's the thing when I do an anthology, stories have to be canon. I don't want just what if stories. When I did my three X-Files anthologies, um, I made sure, I talked to Chris Carter and made sure that I got his permission to, you know, fit the stories in between the episodes of the original show. Yeah. And then he read them and vetted them. So all of those came out as canon. So Aliens is canon and, and the X-Files is canon. That's I cool. That's great about Aliens. Cause like, I thought the Colonial Marines were like some of the cool, like the coolest, um, mainly because, I mean, Michael Bean was there and I'm like, <laughs> Michael Bean. Um, but yeah, like that's, I, I didn't even know about that. So that is like, there's like four things now that are on my list of stuff that you've been talking about that I now have to go find. So yeah. thank you for that. This has been very. And also Aliens is my favorite action film, ex except for that one plot flaw that still pisses me off to this day. Everyone goes down to the planet. They leave no anchor watch on the ship. Yeah. That, that makes, that goes against every bit of common sense, all military protocol why not just have somebody pilot the rescue ship down rather than, than remote bring right. it down? You know, it would still work and still be dramatic. But uh, other than that, I love the movie. <laughs> That's the only thing that bothers you. That's not bad. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I absolutely love the film. And, and in my favorite zombie film uh, is the unrated director's cut of Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. Mine too, man. Best soundtrack. Uh, uh. Great production values. Uh, really good story except the credit sequence fucked up the entire movie by spoiling the, the, her, the heroic sacrifices and they should have should not have done what they, they did in the credit sequence. I don't disagree with that at all. That is that is a very strong point. Got a feeling we would watch the same movies. <laughs> probably <laughs> probably <laughs> quite a few. Yeah, and we can send Josh out for popcorn every time. Hey, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring popcorn and whatever you guys want. You guys uh, want snackies? I got snacks. I you know, love that movie scary. so don't much. Make chores, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, like I, I, I totally agree with aliens, like, but Jason, you're more of an alien than aliens, correct? 
Well, it depends. It's got to be the day. I mean, I, I made a mistake. Last time we talked about favorite horror movies, I said Alien was my favorite horror movie. It is and, a horror. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I misspoke. The Thing is my favorite horror Which movie. Which version? Which version? Carpenters. See, I'm, I'm, st- I'm still... I'm still Peter Graves? The Peter Graves yeah, version? Yeah, yeah with the original and then Carpenters right next to it because Carpenters yeah. more faithful. Definitely, story. sure. But the original, I've only I, seen Carpenters. Uh, the, it's, it's fun to watch them back to back, which I just did last week, actually. I watched them back to back. Oh, who is the, who is the director in the first one? one? Well, it, I forget the guy's name, but it was Howard Hawks. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't supposed, he was supposed to be the producer, but really he directed the damn thing. Right, yeah. Just not officially, because everything in there is, is the way he does his, the, the overlapping dialogue, the naturalistic dialogue, mm-hmm. uh, the banter, all that. That's, that's all Howard Hawks. But you know, I'm a child of the '80s, and I, I, Carpenter's films were just sort of. My dad kind of let me watch whatever, <laughs> so I was watching Escape from New York and uh, The Thing and uh, Big Trouble in Little China, and, and so that's I watched The Thing twenty times when I was, you know, grade six, grade grade five or grade six. Uh, just a fantastic horror movie. So and, and it this, holds up so well. It's it, that, oh, the practicals are just incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's it's beautiful. Now, Big what? Trouble in Little China, by the way, um, is my favorite John Carpenter film. It's so good. What's his and name it, in Big Trouble? Because he's Snake Kurt, and Escape. Kurt, Kurt Russell. Yeah, but what's 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 his what's Jack his, Burton? Jack Burton. Jack Burton. Okay. Yeah, Pork Chop Express. That, yeah, if that movie had come out now, massive hit. Oh, oh, yeah. like, he was he was so far ahead of its time that they didn't get the the cultural satire of the fact that put a white guy in there, he's automatically the hero. Yeah, he's, he's the savior. Not the hero of the story. No. No, he's accidentally the hero. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis Dunn's character is the hero. The main thing I remember from Big Trouble in Little China was this. That was like the main thing I remember from Big Trouble yeah, in Little right. China. Well, I, I, I quote that endlessly. Son of a bitch must pay. I use that every time something annoys me. That line after they kidnap the girl. Son of a bitch must pay. You know. And there's something happened to my truck and I don't want to hear acted God. You know, there's so many great lines in that. It's so, like I told my, it's like I told my last wife. It's all, it's, uh, I, no, oh, shoot, I ruined it. I was so excited to say it. <laughs> it's like I told my last wife, I never drive faster than I can see. Besides, it's all in the reflexes. That's a good quote. Yeah, that is really good. Um, oh. I'm just sitting here with my not another teen movie quotes, just like sitting in, <laughs> sitting in my little base, like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, little Miss Run Home to Her Daddy ran home to her daddy. That's all I got. Um, but no, Randy Quaid's in that movie, so it's a great movie. Um, so, uh, Jonathan, is there anything, you know, upcoming that you're allowed to share with us? Well, yeah. Um, uh, Rotten Ruin is in development for film by Alcon Entertainment. The people yeah. did uh, Book of Eli, uh, Blade Runner 2049, and weirdly, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Um, it's a boutique. I mean, it's 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 they're all like post apocalyptic. The trifecta, so, the trifecta. I mean, it's all, yeah. Uh, but they also do the Expanse TV show, which is a brilliant science fiction. Oh, show. I love. We we were Jason and I were talking about the Expanse, <laughs> and I ruined a part for him. So before we uh, started, you bastard. Um, but I I love Alcon. They they uh, one of the things after my show V Wars was was announced, um, a bunch of studios. Once you have a show that's going to go on TV. They start inviting you to come up and just basically pitch your various IPs, your intellectual properties to them. So um, I went up to Alcon, sat in their offices, and they asked me, like, what do you have that would make a good film? I ran through a couple things, and they they just connected with the Rotten Ruin idea. They read the book, and then they they optioned it right away. And um, they have a significant Marvel movie scriptwriter doing the script for it. I can't say who, but I guarantee you, you, Josh, you've seen the movie that he wrote, and um, uh, Jason, you've probably seen the other films he's done. <laughs> oh, I like this. Mysterious. I'm going to yes. figure this out. The only one I can think of <laughs> would be Cargill. I See Robert be- Cargill? No, nothing? Ah, well. well I, do, I do know Robert, and we've done yeah. that. He's a great guy, but I, I, can't, I can't comment. I yeah, no, I, I got you. I got you. I was like, this is, this is just Josh playing it out, because I'm like, See, here's the thing. I don't really like the Marvel movies. 
Ah, so it's like you make me bleed from the pores now. And that's why I was like, I was so I was like, Gosh. see Robert Cargill because like he did Strange, but then he also did one of those other scary Sin- movies, Sinister I, One and Two. Yeah, Sinister. Yeah, so that's why I was like, Jason would know those. So that's what I was like, hmm. Um, but no, yeah, like, uh, so okay, so with with Rotten Ruin, um. Is that something that you were like, I, I would rather that be a movie than a series or a series than a, you know? Uh, because each book has a self-contained arc to it, I actually did think that would make a good uh, um, movie series. There, yeah. there, there is a, a you know, big bad in each book and it's resolved in each book. Um, a little less so between Flesh and Blood and Dead of, and Flesh and Blood and Fire and Ash because it's, it's, it's a really one big book broken into two, but there are still arcs because the first arc takes place in Nevada, the second arc takes place back in California in, in the Fire and Ash. So they, they, they will work as movies. And um, the screenwriter and I have had some really great conversations about his take on it, and they match what I would have done if I were the screenwriter for it. Um, there are, you know, we're already talking video games and other things. The, the uh, WIDA uh, special effects workshops or WEDA, whatever it's called, uh, is already in conversations with us. I mean, this is still technically an option, but they've right. gone the extra mile of hiring a top screenwriter to do the screenplay, so I like the odds. Uh, other stuff I can talk about. Um, I have a series of short stories about a character, uh, kind of a weird private investigator called Monk Addison. If, if, if somebody's murdered by a serial killer, a ghost comes to him and, and essentially engages his services to stop a serial killer. Oh, cool. To find him, he, has, he takes blood from the crime scene, has the, the face of the murder victim tattooed on his body, and that allows him to relive the murder from their perspective. And then he goes out and finds the killer. Well, I, I, I did some short stories. I included that character as a supporting character in a standalone novel called Glimpse. And a, a couple of Hollywood producers optioned it because they think it would make a great either movie or TV series. I would think that's a TV series. Um, and um, I just did another novel called Ink, which will come out also in November, which in which that character is now the, the main character. Um, so I'm out, that that's that's stuff I can talk about, which is fun. Got a bunch of other things in development, and this thing that we're about to pitch now is based on one of my anthologies. I've edited 17 anthologies. So I'm doing a, a project with one of my anthologies, uh, a notable actor who's been in two successful TV shows and two producers, one of whom was a producer on V Wars. Uh, we are just about to start doing um, studio pitches via Zoom in, in about, uh, well, I think we're starting August 4th. Nice. Can't one name it though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Dude, Jason and I are familiar. <laughs> yeah. Can't do any of that stuff. Yeah, I can't uh, wait. And, and plus, I'm doing something for DC Comics that I, I uh, can't mention anything about either. <laughs> <laughs> What's great is the audio. They're not going to know anything about <laughs> And it's going to be amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Just say it makes this bourbon and coffee taste really good. <laughs> Can I ask a quick uh, question? Or Josh, you have a question? Oh, no, yeah, go ahead. Jonathan, did you – are you on the trajectory that you th- – thought you'd be on when you were younger um or is this just all things are just sort of coming up and you're taking these opportunities or did you say i want to do horror i want to do superhero stuff i want to write comics i want to write novels well it's a little bit of all that i mean when i was a kid i always wanted to be a writer you know but up until you know in college um you know it it, the focus was not fiction i was i I wanted to be either woodward or bernstein right i grew up during the watergate era you know yeah and um, went to school for journalism. Um, actually, most of my my writing career was writing nonfiction part time. You know, 1,200 magazine feature articles, uh, over a dozen nonfiction books. I had no interest in getting involved in in fiction. And then I did one nonfiction book about the folklore of vampires and werewolves called, and it was done under a pen name, by the way. It was uh, the Vampire Slayer's Field Guide to the Undead by Shane McDougall. Okay. The reason I used the pen name is my, my publisher who'd been publishing my martial arts books was afraid that my readers who, you know, had some respect for me as a, as a uh, martial arts instructor would, 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 would think I'd suddenly had a neurological accident if I was now talking about that. <laughs> so I used right. the pen name. That book outsold my martial arts books 30 to 1. And I kept, as I was, you know, reading about, uh, researching all these different kinds of vampires and werewolves and world cultures, 
I kept thinking, well, why, why don't more writers use these versions rather than the Hollywood versions of these monsters? Because the Hollywood versions of vampires, for example, don't fit with folklore. Vampires, there's nowhere in folklore is a vampire afraid of cross. Nowhere in folklore is a vampire, except for the Chinese Jiangsha, no, no vampires are afraid of the sunlight. No vampires are killed by a stake through the heart. You know, all of that They is, don't sparkle. They don't sparkle. Um, and they don't turn turn to dust. You know, uh, I decided to take a, sh a shot at just writing a novel on, you know, a fiction using folkloric monsters just to try to see if I would like it and get it out of my system. That worked out pretty well because the, the novel, I, I not only wound up liking the novel that I wrote, Ghost Road Blues, but it got, it got me a really top agent real quickly and she sold it really quickly and it won the Bram Stoker Award for Best First Novel. And now I'm writing my 37th novel. And that came out in 2006. It's only 14 years. Um, it's been a busy 14 years. Yeah, yeah. The comics thing, uh, I had, you know, I was a comic, I was a Marvel kid. I, you know, in fact, um, I, I have a copy of my very first comic up there. It's a Fantastic Four 66. Um, first one I ever bought with my own money. And uh, huh. I had been talking to my agent about how we might possibly approach Marvel comics because I'd love to maybe write for them. But we, we didn't know anyone there, didn't have an in. And then the editor-in-chief of Marvel had been flying from LA to, to um, New York, had forgotten his Kindle. So he picked up a novel at a, at a Hudson News, you know, in this, the airport. Turned out to be Patient Zero, my first year ledger thriller. Got home, found my number, called me and said, hey, any chance you might want to write for Marvel? What? As it turns out, yes, I might want to write for Marvel. So. <laughs> That's one I of those might. like, hey, would you mind writing for Nar Marvel? It's like, no, I think I'll pass. Like, well, Let me you know, think about it. I, I have a good phone voice, business phone voice, right? I'm like, sure. well, of course, if we can work out the numbers and, you know, physically, I am doing the Snoopy dance around my office. Yes. Yeah. Considering I'm six foot four and about, about the size of Bigfoot is not a good look. But, uh, you know. I am also six foot four and uh, the size of Bigfoot, so. Yeah. We're probably related somehow. Somehow, know. yeah. Limited, limited species, they're hunting us to extinction, but we're, we're there. I'm 5'10". Uh, yeah. And maybe when you hit puberty, you'll get that extra inch or two. Um, one day, one day. <laughs> if I'm lucky, it'll happen. Um, but, uh, and uh, some of the other things, like the TV and all, you know, who doesn't want to you know, have something adapted for TV or film, but yeah. quite frankly, never thought it was possible. But at the same time, I never believed that it was impossible because why not? Exactly. Uh, but I didn't actually go out shopping with my first stuff. Uh, uh, Patient Zero was the first of my books to get optioned. And it was optioned by uh, Mike DeLuca, producer, on behalf of Sony. Sony took it to ABC. They developed a pilot. They had Jeremy Renner and Kate Beckinsale attached to it. And um, they had a great script. All they had to do was make a decision to go ahead with it. And the president of ABC had to decide between that or the Minka Kelly remake of Charlie's Angels. Uh, and um, which lasted three episodes and died taking his career with it too, uh, uh, the, the president. So, um, you know, I've had a bunch of near misses with Hollywood. And then when V Wars, you know, I did the V Wars thing for IDW, they created a media arm to shop the product. And uh, they, they, the first one they shopped was um, uh, Winona Earp. And yep. you know, it's four seasons now. It's a great show. It's a fun show, yeah. Yeah, and then they did uh, they optioned Douglas Adams' Dirk, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, which did not work well on TV. And then the third yeah. was V Wars, which uh, after shopping it for four years, Netflix grabbed it. Had a weird moment with that because um, it it got canceled after one season, even though we had twenty seven million people watch it. Yeah, uh, it was the number one show in one hundred and thirty one of the one hundred ninety seven global markets. But it's one of those examples of things where one person within Netflix and one troublesome person within IDW could not get along. And rather than fight, 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 they said, you know, it's too, it's too much heavy lifting. We're, we're just going to pass. Yeah. So the star of the show, Ian Summerholder and I, are in the process of retooling it and shopping it elsewhere. Oh, good. Yeah, that, that's Great. good. Because, I mean, like, Space Force got a second season, and that was just a train wreck of a show. Like I do not understand how that got a second season. Like it was one of those like they knew what to do with like Steve Carell's character and John Malkovich's character, and then that was it. They were like, let's just have these two, and then the rest of the people can be there. Yeah, and they played it a little safe politically, and it shouldn't have been safe politically. No, it shouldn't have. 
it's like good. when they're like the president's sending me a message or whatever it's like just do it just like yeah. pull the cord just say it it's okay we all know <laughs> have, have some balls you know. yeah so um but you know so that's a long answer to your question jason i yeah, I, yeah. I expected some i hope for some of this to happen but never expected this version of my life to be the case i mean i'm living in southern california you know right near the beach and uh i i know you know my, my friends are tv and movie stars producers and and some of the people whose books i read and idolized are now buddies of mine and that's sure. weird it's the one thing i never really expected in this to be friends with the people whose books i read isn't that something yeah um I mean, I had some dash of that when I was a kid because uh, my middle school librarian was a secretary for two clubs of professional writers. One that met in Philly, that's the, the swords and sorcery crowd, Sprague de Camp and those guys doing the Conan stuff. But the other club was a group that met in New York at a publisher's penthouse. And that included Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Harlan Ellison, uh, Lee Brackett, you know, people like that, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, whoever Whoa, what? Wow. Yeah, whoever was in town, they would they would have this meeting. And Bradbury and Matheson became mentors for three years. Um, I've learned my values really as much from them as from my martial arts instructor, because I wasn't learning any at home. Um, but but then you roll forward all the years where I didn't have contact with any of these people because I was doing part-time nonfiction stuff. And now, you know, I'm friends with Steve King. I'm friends with um, Marv Wolfman, who did my favorite comic, Tomb of Dracula. I'm friends with... Um, you know, Kevin Eastman, the co-creator of Ninja Turtles, you know, it's, it's nuts. You know, uh, a lot of the stars for, for the shows that I really dig are not only friends, but I also get like, reach outs from people um, wanting to be friends. Like Lou Diamond Phillips contacted me recently in the hopes that he can narrate one of my audiobooks. Awesome. And Barack Obama follows me on Twitter. Well, that's a win right there. He, <laughs> he, he likes weird science thrillers. I've heard of him. Yeah. Seems like a seems like a class act. Um, uh, here, we're just gonna just gonna do this for the audio for me real quick. Um, all right, so we're giving away. And Jonathan, I sent I sent the books uh, to you. I gave you the tracking. So here is the issue. I didn't know that USPS can't do a return label, which okay. was weird for me because like. I, it was bizarre. So I basically put the exact same amount of money that it costs to ship it in the box with a little return label thing like that has to be filled out. So it was like the stupidest it, thing. I was like, yeah, I, I, I get that sort of stuff a bunch. It's, it's cool. I, mean, I, I rolled it. Okay. So we're giving away uh, two copies of Rotten Ruin, like two hardcover copies of Rotten Ruin and two hardcover copies of Broken Lands. Cool. So. I just wanted to give you the heads up. So actually, I'll I'll throw in a little bonus to that too. Um, don't go away. Oh, I got these. I got a couple of these left. What this is? It is a rare promo thing of the first few pages of the Rotten Ruin uh, uh, graphic novel that we did. Oh, cool! I'll, awesome. I'll throw one of these in with each of the four books. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna unspike uh, spike the audio again. So. All right, so we are giving away, uh, thanks to Jonathan, we are giving away two copies, uh, two hardcover copies of Rotten Ruin signed by Jonathan and two hardcover copies of Broken Lands signed by Jonathan. And Jonathan, you've got something else that you're going to throw in there as well. Yeah, there's a, uh, from the IDW graphic novel we did, uh, I have a little uh, very rare sampler that has, you know, an, some art from, one of, from some of the action scenes in there and it's really fantastic. It's Tony Vargas's art, and uh, I'll send these things are incredibly rare, so I'll send one to each of the four winners. That's awesome, uh, and it's going to be really easy to uh, enter that contest. All you need to do is you're going to follow uh, Jonathan on the social media. You'll follow um, What's Up Pod on social media, uh, and tag two friends. That's really all you have to do. So we try to make it you know pretty easy for everybody. If you want a bonus entry just uh, put in there your favorite Rotten Ruin character. So it could be Chong, it could be Benny, it could be Lila. You never know. Who knows? Uh, so oh, real quick, Jonathan, who's your favorite Rotten Ruin character? Uh, Tom Amor. Tom? Oh, Tom was so good. Tom, Tom, Tom was one of those really good, decent characters based on a couple of people I know. And uh, I really loved that. And, it's, uh, uh, and one real quick note about it. 
that character has been with me since I was in sixth grade. I've been looking really? for a story to put him in, but I never found it until I sat down to do a project for an adult anthology of zombie stories. And I said, oh man, I, I ought to do this, this guy, a samurai in the post-apocalyptic world trying to hold on to the, you know, the values of the Code of Bushido. But I, you know, I, and I gave him a younger brother to teach those values to, and that became the Rotten Ruin series. Oh man, I like, absolutely love it. Like Tom was one of those ones where I was like, man, if Tom just had a story just all by himself, like I would read the heck out of that. Uh -huh. The most common request I get is for solo Tom. And there is a solo story to tell because I allude to an adventure he had prior to the Rot Ruin novel. So I think at some point I'm actually going to tell that story. Nice. Because I mean, yeah, you have all of like when Benny's growing up, like Tom going into like the Rotten Ruin for the first time and becoming, you know, the badass that he is. So yeah, that would be... That would be and, fantastic. Now there are some some Tom short stories in in the uh, uh, the book bits and pieces, including where Tom first meets Joe Ledger, who becomes his mentor. Uh, because Joe Ledger features in in the rest of the Rot Ruin series, beginning with Flesh and Bone, which is super cool. Like like I said, like I, I think when we started, like I like that everything is intertwined, and it's that's perfect. Um, so uh, real quick, Jonathan, it's where can usefully ev inbred. That's the way I call it. I mean, yeah, might as well. Uh, Jonathan, where can everybody find you social media-wise? Uh, if you spell my name right, it's easy to find. It's Jonathan Mayberry, M-A-B-E-R-R-Y, not M-A-Y, M-A-B. Just get um, the Y out. Yeah, I'm, it's jonathanmayberry.com. Um, and, and by the way, if anyone out there is a writer, on my website, there's a whole page of free stuff for writers, which includes um, a comic book script and novel formats and tons oh, of stuff. Cool. Uh, but also, you know, I'm on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, and Twitter. So you can find me there. And I do a Facebook Live, uh, four o'clock every Thursday, uh, Pacific time. So, you know, it's basically talking about whatever you guys want to talk about. Nice. Awesome. And Jason? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um, at a boy Simpson, at a boy Simpson, and uh, Instagram, uh, at Simstagrams. Can I ask one question really quickly before we go? Jason, come on, man. Not Jonathan, what's your, fav what's your favorite? I, I love, 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 love werewolf movies. What is your favorite werewolf movie? Well, Dog Soldiers by a mile. It, it is Dog Soldiers. Okay. Yeah, I love, I, I watch that probably twice a year, every year. I mean, I, I like The Howling. I like American Werewolf in London. And I like um, Silver Bullet. They're my next three. Right. But Dog Soldiers to me is a perfect film. There's not one thing I would change in it. Wow, wow. It's good. It's a good movie. A great cast, too. Jason, what's yours now? Well, I, I'm a huge Rick Baker fan. So, uh, Joe Johnston's The, the Wolfman, 2010. Um, I, I just, it's so viscerally, uh, <laughs> it's just, it just looks so good. It may have its problems, I'm, and I'm okay with that. It just looks so good, and Anthony Hopkins is incredible. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's my favorite. Well, first of all, I have that Wolfman on my shelf above me. Oh, yeah? Uh, and, and do you know that I actually wrote the novelization of that? It was my first New York Times bestseller. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, and we don't get to see the movie before we write the book. So I had to imagine how the actors would interpret the lines. I had to do tons of research. Oh, no, I did not know that. That's very cool. Yeah, it was my first, uh, David Self wrote the original script and they gave me license to do anything I wanted with it. So I turned it into a really full Gothic novel. And it was my first awesome. bestseller and uh, uh, Emily Blunt was delighted with it. And, um, and so was Del Toro. So yeah, I, I love that movie too. And <laughs> the, one thing I, the one thing I am a little sad though is they CGI'd over some of Rick Baker's practical effects. Right. To me, that is sacrilege. It's like sure, I agree. In the Sistine Chapel. He invented this form. I mean, come on, you, you don't do that. No. Um, they should have left it alone. His work is just immaculate, and it's beautiful stuff. So. And I've met him. He's a, he's a really nice guy too. He's yeah. A great guy. Yeah, that's very cool. That's a really cool uh, little bit of trivia there. That excites me. Cool. Actually, Jason, since you're a fan of that, drop me a message with your uh, mailing address. I'll send you a signed copy of The Wolfman. Woo! I won't get too loud. Thank my you. favorite, my favorite werewolf 
movie is Teen Wolf with Michael J. Fox because he surfs <laughs> on a van. I'm no, just kidding. Um, it's a good. It's a good movie. <laughs> um, no, uh, and we'll put we'll put both Jonathan and Jason's uh, all of their info in the show notes, so you can go to the show notes, click on those, take it to Jonathan's site, take it to all of Jason's stuff. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Josh L. Kane. You can find the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at What's Up Pod. Um, you can also find all of our episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, and on our website, animationstationpodcast.com. <laughs> we haven't got that changed yet. That one, that's one of the, the one holdout that we haven't gotten changed yet. Um, but yeah, Jonathan, Jason, thank you both so much for uh, coming on. This was, this was fun. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. That's what we try. We try for fun. Um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, for um, What's Up Fandom, I'm Josh. I'm Jason. Jonathan. Warrior Smart, everybody. I'm not the